it's all right. That's relative, right? And if you got offended by that and said, who's he calling old? Then, okay, you need, you need some healing. You're older than you were. Anybody else that, anybody else that's older than you were? Anybody else that's older? Okay, all right. Doesn't that make you feel better? Amen. Bill Pollard, good to see you. Bless you, man. It is good to be seen. It's good to be upright. Beats the alternative. Amen. I received a, a lovely uh, birthday card. You know, when you, when you do start getting a little older, uh, you start getting birthday cards that encourage that mindset. Anybody know what I'm talking about? So I got a birthday card. I won't say whose picture was on the front. That does add to the humor for sure. But the birth car, birthday card, he says, happy birthday to you. Happy. Uh, oh, you know the deal. <laughs> That's an old man card, right? Happy. Uh, uh, oh, you know the deal. <laughs> I love collecting those cards. Uh, today is my birthday, and I'm uh, very thank you, very reflective. <laughs> thank you. And, uh, and I'm celebrating it. I'm celebrating it. You know, when, you get, when you're born in 1863, you begin to celebrate everything that comes after that. I have been uh, amazingly celebrated already this weekend. My wife knows how to celebrate. I'm telling you, she, she always just over the top. So she uh, booked us a little uh, two-day golfing excursion. So we went down to Austin. My, my sons had given me a, a golf certificate, I think, over a year ago uh, to a shop down there. And I, I know they're thinking, you know, they're going to give me a, a gift certificate to a, to a golf shop close to them so that I will invite them to go play. And then I end up using spending the golf certificate on, on them. And that's exactly what we did. It was fun. We had a, had a great time, and uh, then we went over to my oldest son's uh, home where his wife, who is an incredible cook, uh, fixed us stuff that is not on our regular menu. But I won't even go into it now because we'll have people trickling out the door. But I'll just say homemade from scratch cheesecake. That was the most amazing thing. And so uh, we've been celebrated. Thank you, baby, for celebrating me so well. Thank you. She does. And, and you may think that 68 is old. I don't think 68 is old. My grandma lived to 106. And uh, the Lord says, uh, how much can you do in the next 40 years? So that's, my, that's where I'm at. And when I looked at my first 40, I got quite a bit done in my first 40. How about you? How many of you got a lot of done that you wanted to forget about getting done? So, so uh, you, you can uh, go however long you want to go to you satisfied 80 years is is no uh no necessity you can walk with the lord so we're going to do that setting our hearts to do it and i'm just i told folks uh i had a pastor friend one time i'm okay it's my birthday i'm going to tell some stories that all right so so i had a pastor friend one time and he was he was getting pretty pretty old he's he was like uh, almost 80 years old uh, but part of the problem was he was he's losing some of the connections. His synapses weren't firing as well. And this was kind of a, a typical Pentecostal church. And of course, you wear a suit and a tie and, and whatnot. So during the, um, at the end of the song service, we'd do kind of what we just did in that church. Uh, everybody would go greet each other and you have that greeting time. And while the people are greeting, the pastor and the youth pastor and the worship guy would would have a little huddle and talk about what's coming next and so the pastor just reached over and took the youth pastor's tie the youth pastor was my friend took the youth pastor time blew his nose on the tie didn't 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 think anything of it but some of the some of the you know board members saw it said mm, what was that you know okay everybody knew he was kind of getting there well the next sunday he's offering communion you got the communion table down front everybody in remembrance of me, you got the communion table, and you had the communion emblems in the front, and you had, had a, a lit candle on each side. And so they've had their worship, and it's time for communion, and he just reaches down, and he, he, ta 
takes the lit candle and he puts it to his mouth to lead everybody, burn himself a little bit. So, so I'm saying I'm going to preach. I'm going to preach to at least 90 without drooling on my shirt. That's what I'm saying. How many of you agree with me? I'm going to preach, teach till 90. I'm saying without drooling on my shirt. So if you start seeing me uh, drool on my shirt, just Cheeky will take care of it. <laughs> She'll take care of it. Praise the Lord. I was reading this morning, and, and we're, we're talking about making disciples these next few weeks. We are a discipling community. Uh, we don't really have any um, prepared quizzes for you so that you can take a measurement and say, how am I doing? But I want to constantly be asking you the question. It's a question you don't hear much in church. Because frankly, most churches have given up on making disciples. They just want faithful church attenders. And so I've been in that for 40 plus years and really felt like the Lord's called us to really make disciples, disciples in sonship, knowing who you are, sons. And so we're not really about, you know, keeping score. Competition is not the issue. Comparison is not even the issue as sons buy an amen anywhere just all right it's, it's not about comparison competition it is about us saying lord uh, am i following you in the obedience that you call for in my life are you developing a larger and larger footprint in my soul so that obedience is more of a thing of your spirit a natural response to you speaking in me than me having to make myself do something. So in these next few weeks, as we talk about different aspects of discipleship, and we're, we're responding to your response to the survey that we sent out a couple of months ago, and we've, we've taken uh, those of you that said this is the most important, the thing I need to hear about the most is this one, the thing I need to hear about the most is this one. And we're starting from the top, and we're working our way through your responses on those. So if you want to know why did, you, why did we start with this, it's because you wanted us to start with this. At least it was your response to say, this is the thing I need the most. And so we, we want to think through these simple questions that a lot of times we don't want to think through. Uh, this is like that. Not anything where I'm going, but this is like that. Do I have enough money in the bank to retire? You know, most people don't want to sit down and have to work through that and say, eh, I'm not sure I like the, the picture on the other side of that. This question is more simple because you've got the Holy Spirit as the driving force inside of you that's doing the work to get us to where we are. All he needs is our, yes, I'm in, do what you want to do in my life. So here's the question. The question is, am I growing in my discipleship as a son or daughter of the Lord? Am I growing in my obedience Am I growing in my ability to hear his voice and respond to that? Am I growing in the fruit of the Spirit that releases me from all of these fear jabs that the world wants to bind you up with? Turn everything into some kind of a fear culture to just keep you paralyzed. Keep you running after something that's not here yet or tied to where you've already been. I mean, you know, Satan's tools is always to get you tied up with the past or always look into the future so that you can never just enjoy being with him right now. Sons and daughters don't get too moved about the past or the future because we know our life is hid with Christ in God, and that doesn't come when you get to heaven. That comes here and now. Everybody say, right now. Right now. My life is hid with Christ in God right now. So I was reading in my uh, daily a reading this morning in Deuteronomy chapter uh, 29. In Deuteronomy chapter 29, he, he's talking about the law, and the law is given to the nations. And, and, and Moses is pretty hardcore, man. He says, you're, you're going you're gonna to leave this law. You're going to forsake this law, and you're going to be scattered to the nations. 
Well, that's a good prophecy. How many of you think you can build a prophetic ministry with that? You're going you're gonna to be you're going to be driven to the nations, but I'm going to gather you again. He's pretty pretty clear about it. And he says, so it may not happen when he hears the words of this curse that he blesses himself in his heart, talking about the people of Israel hearing the words in Deuteronomy 28, you know, is the blessings and the curses. This is the way a covenant was made. You, you just bless one another with everything that's going to come on you if you obey the covenant, and then you curse with every curse that's coming on you if you disobey the covenant. And that's what Deuteronomy 28 is. And so he's been enumerating the curses, and he says, if it, it happens when you hear the words of this curse that he blesses himself in his heart, saying, I shall have peace even though I follow the dictates of my own heart. Listen to that now. Uh, humanity's always been shot through with this. I don't know of any generation that, that has had to grapple with this more than, than our generation. I'm not just talking about one generation, but all of us in this, this room that we've been taught to just what Hollywood says, follow your own heart. Follow your own, what, what they really mean is your emotions, because to Hollywood, your emotions are your heart. And in the Old Testament, it was kind of that same thing. It wasn't spirit, soul, and body. It was, it was heart or soul is the, the invisible and material part of you, and then the body is the material part of you. So he says, there will be those that say, I blessed myself in my heart. I shall have peace even though I follow the dictates of my own heart as though the drunkard could be included with the sober. So this, the Lord is saying, N this is not an all-inclusive deal that you can just do what you want to do, live the way you want to live, and you're going to be blessed. Now, we get a lot of sense of that in our day, that God loves everybody, and you can do what you want to do, and you're just going to be blessed. We're all blessed. You're blessed when you walk in covenant with him, hearing his voice, making him your best friend, and quickly obeying what he calls us to do. I mean, you know, no matter how spirit-filled you may have been through your life, if you choose to disobey, what's coming next is not good. It's not because God's looking for a way to hurt you or do something bad. He's put stop sign after stop sign after stop sign in front of you. But if you keep disobeying the stop signs, there's going to be a wreck, right? And it wasn't his doing. It was our doing. And our disobedience. Discipleship really comes down, of course, based on the word discipline, it comes down to hearing and then obey. I hear what the Lord says, I do it as quickly as I can. I know what he's already said to me, so I don't drift away from that. I stay in tune and in line with what he's already said. Now, this whole morning, we've been focused on hearing the Father's voice. That comes with consequences. Hearing his voice and doing it comes with a consequence of blessing, blessing upon blessing. But hearing his voice and ignoring it and then doing what you want to do, as he would say here, after his own heart, the dictates of his heart, as though the drunkard could be numbered with the sober. Then just a little further, chapter 30, verse 1, now it shall come to pass when all these things come upon you, the blessing and or the curse which I've set before you, and you get to determine which one you get, and you call them to mind among all the nations where the Lord your God drives you. You see, from the very beginning, it was the Lord's intent that this covenant would be a global covenant. He's going to drive the nations, and we see that even in Acts chapter 1, chapter 2, there had to come a famine in Jerusalem before the church could loosen up and go to the nations. But this has always been his plan. And then you return to the Lord your God and obey his voice. Why is God going to have to drive them to the nations? Because they disobeyed his voice. But when they return and he brings them back, what's he, what are they going to do? They're still going to have to obey his voice. How many of you see that obeying the Father's voice is still the key thing? <laughs> we haven't gotten so mature now that we can live any way we want to live and follow the dictates of our flesh. A little porn here, a little drunkenness over there, and somehow it's okay because we're in the grace generation. There is no generation that gets beyond obedience to the voice of the Lord. Amen. 
So here are these that we're looking at, and they're not the only ones. There, there are some more that need to be in this list. Um, the practice of solitude, solitude without isolation, abiding in the fullness of the Spirit. I mean, you know, this is possible that you can actually do this all the time. I go to Sundays, I go to a charismatic church for that. No, you have the charisma of the Holy Spirit in you for that. You don't ever leave that, and he will never leave you. You feel right in a charismatic church because you already have that living and stirring inside of you. Well, I can't preach all these, can I? Hearing the Father's voice. (laughs) Staying with the conversation. We've been talking a lot about it, and it is the key. So we're going to talk some more about it. Living in a life of submission. Living a life of submission. Well, that doesn't sound very New Testament. Oh, this is just the life of God. We talked about that in an unusual Easter sermon, right? I know, I know, I know. I know we got 10 weeks. I just want people to feel like they know where we're going. Then receiving life from the Lord's table. How many know you can take communion outside of the church? We want to build it into our homes. Maintaining integrity of heart. In a corrupt world, maintaining integrity of heart in a corrupt world, feeding myself on the word of God, pursuing the life of a worshiper, living in the power of baptism. That's really sanctification. The Old Testament would be the idea of Gilgal, the cutting away of the flesh, and living in the power of the Spirit. All these go together. Continuing in the spirit of forgiveness and blessing. How many of you know if you don't continue to forgive and bless those that have cursed you, that have wrongfully used you, You're going to stymie your growth in the Lord. We have to learn as disciples to stay free from unforgiveness and the wounds that come with that. How lovely is your dwelling place, almighty Lord. There's a hunger deep inside my soul. Only in your presence. Is my heart and flesh restored? How lovely is your dwelling place. Do you know that? All the old folks in the room, sing it with me. (laughs) How lovely is your dwelling place, almighty Lord. There's a hunger deep inside my soul. Only in your presence. Only in your presence is my heart and flesh restored. How lovely is your dwelling place. How lovely is your dwelling place. I was singing this this morning when Jim saw me uh, in the spirit worshiping the Lord. This is where we live. We don't go to church to find it. I I want to disciple you not to myself, but to the Spirit and the presence of the Lord and the Word of the Lord so that when you see something that is other than, when you see something that's human-driven, it sticks out like a sore thumb to you. You can be in places where it's so emotionally driven. Oh, don't you feel the presence of God in this? Don't you feel? Oh, don't you feel the presence of God? Oh, this. And it's just like, oh. It becomes a show. I want you to have such a keen discerning between the real Spirit of God at work in hearts. And it doesn't always look like all of that. Sometimes it does. You need to be able to know the difference. You need to be able to know when prophets are prophesying stuff that's just based on, uh, you know, the, the, the winds of the world and when it's what the Lord is saying to the church. We have to grow up in the things of God. So we live in crazy days where the very roots of our own civilization are being challenged. Indeed, some of them need to be challenged. But the foundations of Christianity are also being put to the test. We call it the post-Christian era. Everybody says the church is dying. Membership is fading. Churches are empty. Well, that's been true throughout the the, the 2,000 years of New Testament Christian experience, that the move of God moves around the earth. We'd love to say that Ephesus is still filling up the stadium with the church, but it's not. That, that stadium is empty. That city is broken down and, and gone. 
Islam has come in and filled that vacuum. That's a very real reality in the history of our world. What does that mean? We have to grow up as disciples. We have to begin to hear his voice, not just put our finger to the wind and see which way everybody is moving. Well, everybody's going over there. I think we ought to go over there and check it out. What does the Lord say? What does the Lord say? The measure of our faith is the life each of us live in and receive from God. This is a daily walk in the life and the love between the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's learning to be at home in his dwelling place. Now, where is that? It's not a church building. We know that. But it might be right in the middle of turmoil. Jesus has almost bled out on that cross when he cries out that most intimate term, Abba, Father. Oh, he's not forsaken. He knows his Father will never forsake him. Into your hands I commit my spirit. You can live in that lovely dwelling place no matter what kind of hell. You can be in the fiery furnace itself, and Jesus is the fourth man standing there with you. Oh, we're talking about solitude, right? Solitude. Solitude without isolation. This is what we want to get you to today. We want you to begin to commune with the Lord in such a way that no matter how busy things are around you, right down in here, you can hear his voice, be in his presence. Your external religious scaffolding may be tested and found wanting, but your life in Christ, the true foundations and buildings of the kingdom, is sure. The Hebrew writer tells us everything that can be shaken will be shaken. You just need to mark that down. And any human system is a thing that can be shaken. The Lord said to me, and I mentioned it last week, said to me in about 10 days ago, he said, Kerry, put no energy in trying to support and sustain human systems. They will all fail. Let's strip away the scaffolding and take a look at the essential elements of life in Christ. Sons and daughters who know who they are in God. This is is what this series is about. What does this life look like? When you strip all the the rah-rah away, what's my life like when I'm, it's me and him. Me and him and whatever battle I might be having to fight. What can we export to any nation or culture on the planet that will nourish life in God without just exporting Americanism? And that's what we've been exporting for a long time. Let me explain that. I've had the, I've had the joy of ministering in 36 different nations, and I've seen Americanism exported. And I think I told the story in in Manila, Philippines, massive church, two or three thousand people didn't have a building. So they're meeting outdoors. But in those three thousand people, I could point out the ministers, the pastors. How could I tell? They're the only men wearing triple knit Swiss suits and pouring sweat in a hot Philippine sun. The rest of them are wearing the very light white linen shirts and fine. And the guys that have believed that you couldn't have an anointing unless you had a suit and a tie on were the ones that were suffering. And we've actually exported that kind of an idea. See it a lot of places. So what do we need to do? Well, we don't rail on that. We just begin to get life in our own spirits and begin to go and give that away and find the power of relationship. You know why you don't have to get stirred, frightened, fearful when you hear things about electrical pulses because of a, a full eclipse or because we're in relationship. If things go south, we know where our company is. We know who our family is. We know where to go. We know who we're connected to. Put a lock on the door. We're still meeting. We're still meeting. If you lock us out of this building, we're still going to find a place to meet. We're going to know where the church is if everything's locked. So here's our overarching question. If everything were to be challenged, 
cultural scaffolding removed. 501c3 charitable status tax exemption removed. Oh, really? <laughs> Would you still give anyway? I can't take it off of my taxes. Would you still give anyway? <laughs> Ooh, now we're getting serious. Start talking about my money. What are the irreducible pillars and the practices of life in God that would hold me firm and empower me to stand strong no matter what's going on around me? Can you tell this pastor is trying to prepare you for what's ahead? I saw somebody post something on social media this week. said, don't tell me trouble's coming to America. Ha! It ain't coming to America. We're blessed of the Lord. Oh, come on. Grow yourself up. This is why we think a, a full eclipse over America is a big deal when they're going on three every two years around the world. What happens when there's a full eclipse in China? Do you, you think they're afraid something's going to happen? I'm, I'm hitting this a little more head on than you are. We are a part of the church. We're not the whole church. And I got news for you. America is not exempt from bad things happening when we turn our back on God, kill babies, and discredit the poor and everything else. We're not exempt. It's why the church has to pray. The church has to lift up her voice. The church has to be a voice that's crying out to God. God, spare us. Send your power. Send your blessing instead of what we deserve. Be the church. So the opening of a new millennium finds the church in the West in a deep need for restoration of spiritual disciplines. The current compartmentalization of spiritual life and secular life in many believers' minds is evidenced by the current statistics that reveal too little of a difference between the ways a non-believer lives and the way a believer lives. We desperately need a reorientation toward a Christianity that affects our worldview, our behavior, the way we think, so that when something that is not of God comes to us, we know it. We're not handling the counterfeit. We're only handling the true and the real, so when a counterfeit comes, we immediately know it. So we seem to fall into one of three tendencies, either to succumb to the world's view of what's valuable and be superficial or success, success based on things we can see, or swing to the other extreme of superficial Superior spirituality, woo, totally out there somewhere, of sensationalism, can't get enough, always more, always going for more. There's got to be more. When will you get content with the God of the ages who lives inside of you? It doesn't mean there's not more that he's got coming. Of course, he's got a plan. But I'm content here. I'm content now. I'm content in the Spirit of God in me that knows what's coming, and he will show me things to come. I'm not permanently unhappy because I'm not there yet. Don't you think this has something to do with being seated now in heavenly places in Christ Jesus? He didn't say if y'all all obey and everything's just right, if you pass the cosmic quiz, then you might one day be seated in that high place. Go up through all those layers and get to the high. He said you're already there. I'm already there. I'm already seated with him in heavenly places. So why? The whys of the disciplines, number one, the regeneration of a man through salvation is not a modification of what's there, but a recreation. Any new creations in Christ in the room? New creations in Christ. We're a recreation. Although the heart is new, the mind must be renewed. We have to come to see that Jesus is what we look like to God. Jesus is what we look like to God, and he's not blind. Does your mind kick that out? Well, I'm, I, no, I'm not like Jesus. 
Well, you are in God's view and by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is connecting you and the way you be and the way you do with who Jesus bees and does. That is a process. The Father has nothing for you that is not the best thing for you. Secondly, Jesus' leaders and believers must be differentiated from the world, living out of a different place as source. I am not counting on this world to provide me anything. I am obeying the Lord. He's blessing the work of my hands. How many of you know he'll bless the work of your hands? We're not sitting in our living room on the couch singing Kumbaya waiting for God to drop money out of buckets out of heaven. He said, I will bless the work of your hands. So there's a partnership always. Everything God is doing will include a partnership. Is this too strong? Everybody go, uh, 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 uh. We can pray for revival, and in our minds, we think this mist is going to come out of heaven and float through the streets. And everybody that gets touched by the mist is going to come to God. No, you are the mist. The church is the fullness of God bodily, and he's sending us through the streets. If we don't go, it doesn't get there. Are you praying, come quickly, Lord, come quickly? You know what he's saying? You get out and get it to every nation, and then I can come quickly. You preach this gospel to every ethnos, and then I can come quickly. It's a partnership. Everything God does is a partnership. Why? Because he's a relational God. Thirdly, Jesus, leaders and believers, draw from their spirit, the Holy Spirit living in your spirit, that's a capital S and a small s, not the mind as your primary source. If Jesus were to walk in here today, you've heard me say it many times, if Jesus were to walk in this room physically, he wouldn't look around and look for the smartest guy in the room. He wouldn't look for the most educated guy in the room. He wouldn't look for the most handsome guy or gal in the room. He would look for the one that would say yes no matter what he told him to do. He would look for the obedient hearts who, is there a scripture for that? Oh, yeah. <laughs> There's a scripture for that. <laughs> Jesus is doing miracles, and, and a woman cries out in, in the midst of the crowd and says, Oh, blessed is the woman who gave you birth. Blessed is the breast from which you nursed. Who's she talking about? Mary, of course. But what did Jesus say? Oh, yeah, but even more. He says, even more than that are those who hear my words and do it. Now, he wasn't putting Mary down because she got in that place because she did what? She heard the word, and she said, be it unto me according to the word. She did that, but Jesus said, don't set her up on a pedestal. You get in the same current of hearing my voice and doing what I say, and you'll be blessed just like her. The source of the disciplines is not willpower, but internal spirit-born impulses. This is the power. This is the miraculous thing of the new creation. God doesn't give us a long list. You know, it's the sign on the end of the pool. Ten rules for swimming in the pool. Don't run. You know, there's other things we say. This is not the way the kingdom works. God says, I will put my spirit in you. And cause you to walk in my ways and to keep my commandments. How's that? Willpower? No. Spirit power? Yes. So Paul says, I don't even come and preach to you anymore out of my own skillful intellect. Using the eloquence of men's wisdom. Why? Because if I do that, you're going to put your faith in men's wisdom. You're going to try to get the same education. You're going to try to say it the same way. I had a friend in Bible college whose thumb was cut off as a, as a child. His older brother caught it, you know, in the chain of the bicycle. So he's still getting healing for that, you know, I mean, emotional healing. But yeah. Powerful preacher, and he would preach like this. Of course, he had to, right? He had to. That's all he had. Just looked like this. And he preached like that. And a whole bunch of young men started coming around him as a mentor. And, and they didn't even realize they were doing it. But they would, they would preach like this. 
Finally, I talked to a couple and said, why do you preach as if you have no thumb? I don't do that. Pull up my little phone, show a little video. Wow. See, it's not the personality of the person ministering the word. We can have a soul tie to leaders' personalities. That won't get you anywhere. You say, well, it, it, it kind of feels, feels dead in here. You know, there's, there's almost an intentionality for us not to try to rah-rah you up when we come together. Why? Because if you put your faith in the rah-rah, you're going to be very easily swayed by somebody that can rah-rah better than we can rah-rah. Somebody that's got more speakers, more lights, more fog machines, and can really rah-rah with a big crowd. What you need to hear is the raw that comes from heaven when you're by yourself and you're having to fight a battle and you feel like nobody's around. There is a cloud of witnesses that have you in their gaze. They are supporting you, though you may not be able to hear them. The ancient paths start with duties that become disciplines that become delights. First, it feels like, oh, here's just something I got to do. Get up in the mornings. Anybody hate routines? Oh, man, I'm the original routine hater. I would go to school a different way every morning just to not get in the routine. I would put my belt on a different direction every morning just to not get in a routine. I hate routines. Because of that, it was a long time before I really developed a solid devotional life because I was so afraid I was just going to get into a routine. And I finally found out that I better get started with something where I know when I sit down where I'm going because I would go sit down to have devotion with the Lord and go, <sighs> Lord, what verse do you want me to read today? Then how many of you know what you do with that? <laughs> he hung himself, go thou and do likewise. <laughs> so I finally got into the one-year Bible. That's what I was reading from this morning. One-year Bible. Did the one-year Bible for 32 years. And then the Lord said, mm, you kind of stuck there, Carrie. Let's try something else now. Takes me into something else. Beautiful. That's the word of the Lord. But I, in the morning, I'd get up, and I wouldn't have to worry. Well, what verse am I reading today? Oh, April 7th. It's the same one every April 7th. I come back to it, and I get the whole thing. Well, that's where I was. That's what I needed. It starts with duty. The duty becomes a discipline. It becomes a habit. It becomes your way of life. People can, can, can know that you're going to be predictable. How many of you know it's important in family to know somebody's going to be predictable? To know somebody's going to be faithful. Somebody's up making the coffee in the morning. Praise the Lord. Somebody, you know, somebody's faithful and predictable. We can't all be floating stars going around you doing whatever feels good at the moment. There'd be nothing when we show up. So it begins with what seems like a duty, and then it turns into a discipline, a habit, that then because of the presence of the Lord that you find there, I get up every morning and sit in the same place. Now, I move around a little bit now. Chicky has to pray for grace, but, you know, I, I, I still kind of in this, I, I'll, I'll, the front room is my place for a little while, and then there's books stacked everywhere and seven translations and all this, and that's kind of my little spot right there. And then for the next 30 days, it's up in the library, and then the next 30 days, it's over here. And there's still some moving around, but, it's there. Pray for Cheeky because she comes in and she just sees these stacks of books here and then the stacks and it's kind of like migration going on in them. Whatever it takes for you to find the place where you hear the Father's voice. But I begin, because I heard my, my mentor pray this one time, I begin this way. I say, Father, here I am again, this same place, this same time this morning. 
If you have anything to say to me, you know I'll be here today. I'll be here tomorrow. I'll be here the next day. There's a power that comes in that stability when your duty turns into a discipline that turns into delight and a satisfaction because now you're, you're clearing away the rubble. You're getting all of your little stuff out, and you're just tuning in to him. It's not a slavery to ingrained habits. Uh, it's a submitting to a pathway where the Lord can come and speak to you on a regular basis. Today we start with a discipline of solitude without isolation. And I'm just going to give you some, some key, unchanging precepts that make this a necessity for you. And we start with this idea, every breakthrough in your life is preceded by a breakthrough in revelation. Would you say that with me? Every breakthrough in my life is preceded by a breakthrough in revelation. You'll see it all through the scriptures. And I'll give you some examples here in a minute. Every breakthrough, man, I need a breakthrough. All right. First thing you need is a breakthrough in Revelation then. You need to see what God wants to do in that situation and what he's got planned for you. A breakthrough in Revelation has to precede every breakthrough in your life. Why? Because God is one who shows you what he's going to do before he does it and brings you in on it. Every breakthrough in your life is preceded by a breakthrough in Revelation. Then we can say this. Revelation is preceded by reflection and reflection is preceded by rest. Now let's flip this around and this will make some sense to you. Rest leads to reflection because you're asking question when you get rest. I want to say when you get bored. Some of us are allergic to boredom, but boredom is where rest comes and revelation breaks through. If you're always running and always busy and always trying to conquer the task and you never have any windows, well, this is boring. Then all of a sudden God speaks to you. Rest precedes reflection. Reflection precedes revelation. And we just put repentance is quite often right there too. Reflection can lead to repentance. Oh, God, that's, you said, I oh, forgot about that. Oh, yes. Forgive me, Lord. Put me right back. Repentance. And then repentance leads to revelation, and revelation then leads to breakthrough. It's not really complicated. It's the same in any relationship. If you're dating, you really know this very clearly. You have to learn to get with someone, spend time with them. What do you want to do more than anything else when you're falling in love? You want to spend time with that person. And what are you doing? That's what I call the season of discovery. You're asking questions because you just want to know them better. So you're asking all kinds. Who was your hero when you were growing up? What do you like to do? What's your favorite food? What's your favorite this? What's your favorite that? It's a, you're getting to know someone. That is, you're getting a revelation of who they are which precedes a breakthrough in the future of your life. Yes? So Daniel's visions, you read Daniel, that vision came out of a duty that turned into a discipline that became a delight. And even when the edict said, you will not pray, he could not not pray. Daniel's vision came out of a deep commitment to cultivate a time and a place of prayer even when the duty of state and false edicts were pressing on him. Elijah's revelation, the revelation of a house of sons called the school of prophets, all of that came after his grand demonstration of power, destroying these prophets of Baal and then winding up depressed under a juniper tree. If you're chasing the event, if you're chasing signs and wonders as an end goal, you're going to find depression in that chase. Jesus was not coming to the earth to chase signs and wonders. He was simply overflowing the Father's love for broken people, and signs and wonders is the byproduct of what that looks like. If you are in love with the Father, which will put you in love with people, signs and wonders will follow you, not lead you. 
John the Baptist, his revelation didn't come from the throngs of followers, but out of the solitude in the wilderness. In the solitude of the wilderness, he got a revelation that he was going to be the pathway, the road that Messiah would walk into. He got a revelation when Jesus came walking up to him that he could introduce him with knowledge. How did he introduce him? This is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Had Jesus passed him a note somewhere back there in grade school and gave him that? No, he got that in the wilderness by revelation. Jesus' ministry, boot camp, started when the Holy Spirit drove him into the desert for 40 days of what? Solitude. And what's reverberating in him? The Father's voice. So when the enemy tempts him with the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, the pride of life, self-preservation, self-promotion, self-provision, what does he have coming out of him? The word of the Lord. The word of his Father. He wasn't just picking a verse out of the promise box and quoting a verse. He's speaking the word that the Father had given him that became a sword in his mouth. The revelation of the Father's word came to him in this place of solitude. Boredom. What do you do in the wilderness for 40 days? The apostle John received the revelation of Jesus Christ. We call it the book of Revelation when he was exiled in the Isle of Patmos. Everybody say boredom. Boredom. What do you do when you're exiled on Lonely Island? Well, you figure out how to fish. You get into a lot of reflection, and then all of a sudden the heavens open up and you get a revelation that blesses 2,000 years of the church. And what does John say when he begins writing this? I was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day. Was that just a Lord's Day thing? I think on the Isle of Patmos he got in the Spirit probably every day. given a revelation for this generation. The Apostle Paul is the same. You, you see there's a trend here. Everybody that has left us something here that transforms our lives got that thing, not in a conference somewhere, not that that's wrong, but they got that thing in this place of isolation with the Father to where they be, came to the end of themselves and said, God, unless you speak to me, I don't know what's coming next. Reflection. I don't have what I need to do it. Anybody ever come to that place? You kind of realize, uh, I don't have what it takes. That comes out of reflection. That varied statement is a reflection answer. I don't have the resources I need to make this work. Uh, reflection. Then maybe some repentance. Oh, I wasn't supposed to do that anyway. God, I need your help. And here he comes. Revelation. Here's how to do it. Brian told us about how God came to him this morning. The Lord came to him when he was ready to quit the business he was trying to start. The Lord said, don't, don't give up now. You're almost there. That word was the breakthrough in the middle of his muddle. <clears throat> Everybody okay? All right. We're coming to the end. Mark chapter 1, verse 34. In the morning, having risen a long while before daylight, he went out and departed to a solitary place, and there he prayed. I'm not advocating to you that just getting by yourself, going and checking into a retreat, or get you a pop-up tent and go put it on the beach somewhere for three days is going to be a magic pill, and all of a sudden the heavens are going to open over you. Jesus went into a solitary place, a lonely place, might be like a wilderness place. He did what? He communed with the Father. He prayed. He's talking to God about. Remember the word prayer doesn't just mean asking for, but it means asking about. If you just go to a solitary place and you just work through your list of all the things you want God to give you, there may not be a revelation breakthrough. But if you go to ask him about, here's reflection. Ask him about, Lord, am I where you want me to be? 
in my life. I'm talking about my spiritual journey, my, my growth in you. Is there anything that's hindering me? I'm giving you some keys here. Is there anything that's hindering me from moving to the next thing that you've prepared for me? Is there something I'm not willing to let go of because I think it's who I am? What do you want to say to me about what you have made me for? Because perfection in God is a fulfillment of purpose. And every single one of us in this room have a divine purpose. And he's called you to come to the fulfillment of that person, that purpose, where you don't have to work at it, you don't have to strive at it. When you get full, it just flows out of you. There's a dignity in God, in spirit fullness. When you get full, you don't look crazy as much as you look, whoa, that dude can do stuff. I want to know how to do that. Paul says it this way, the biblical genius definition. He says, you'll have insights into everything, but nobody can figure out how you do what you do. Let's say it together. I'll have insights into everything, but nobody can figure out how I do what I do. Let's say it again. I will have insights into everything, but nobody can figure out how I do what I do. That's 1 Corinthians 2.15. That's a biblical definition of Jesus, genius, and it's what happens to us when we learn to partner with the Holy Spirit. So here's the first key. Where is God for you? Where is God for you? Is he out there somewhere? And you're having to go through all these hoops to try to get to him? Is he back there? Something your parents had, but you kind of lost it. Is he in that generation or is he in the generation to come? Or is God right here, right now for you? I love Evelyn's testimony, ministering to the guy out there in Germany, Rome. And she kept saying, right here, right now. Jesus wants to be with right here, right now. Right here, right She said, I don't know why I'm saying that. It just kept coming. Right here, right now. And the guy says, why do you keep saying right here, right now? He said, I don't know. I'm just, I'm just sharing with you, and it just keeps coming out. He opens up his shirt right here, tattooed on his chest, right here and right now. God will give you a word because he is right here, right now for you. He's not tomorrow for you. He's not yesterday for you. He's right here today for you. But you have to decide to spend some time with him to get to that. Transformation comes by realizing your union with God right here and right now, regardless of any performance or achievement on your part. Authentic Christianity overcomes the God is elsewhere idea. The revival is happening over there. Well, I've, I've gone to revival meetings before. I've gone to Pensacola. I've gone to Toronto. I've gone to places. But here's something we've got to get zeroed in and synced into our spirit, and that is the revival is happening wherever I am and the Holy Spirit is speaking and moving. Wherever I hear God speak and I obey, there's a revival right there. What if all the church caught that? What if all the church decided, I'm not running over there for revival. Revival is going to happen right here, right now. And we would watch a global awakening as the church rises up and takes her place. Secondly, God as Holy Spirit is precisely known as the indwelling, vitalizing presence. What did I miss? Hmm? The incarnation. Okay, you see it, the incarnation. I'm trying to get us through here. Contemplation. Let's go there. What are some ways that you're experiencing solitude now? I know we've got some young mothers here, and you say, uh, I haven't had solitude in about a year and a half. Understand that. There are seasons for all of us. There are seasons that are seems like everything is compressed and I can't do anything but run. And you really have to learn to have your solitude on the way. I was out walking my my dog this morning, Ollie, and just experiencing sunshine and fresh cool breeze. It won't be that way forever in Texas, amen. 
fresh, cool breeze, nice and cool, and the dog's not talking back to me, right? So I'm not having to carry on this conversation with the dog. That's nice. And I find I can have 15 minutes of solitude walking my dog. And I do that almost every morning. Just pray in the Spirit, walk the dog. So what is it that you walk? What do you do? The drive to work? We can get in the habit of putting on Siri or putting on radio, putting on stuff. Maybe that's that one little space. And I just want to say to you, I, I, I want to give you, I think, what would be a promise of God for your heart. Maybe you're in a place right now where you are busting it from before sunup to way after sundown, and you barely get a few hours of sleep at night in bed, and that's all you do. I want you to ask the Father to carve out a solitude place in your day so that you can see it coming and you know it and you walk into that presence with him. It may be the shower. Shower's a great place to worship the Lord, you know. (laughs) Whatever it is, contemplation is where you find connection with God. And you may not be in a stage of life right now where you can carve out that place of boredom. But if you'll ask God for a space, when I need to write a book, I say, God, I can't write a little bit every day. I need a block of time. And it's amazing how he will give us maybe a week here or a week there, a block of time. He knows what you need. William, he knows what you need, bro. He knows how much time you need when you're having to build everything that you're trying to build. He knows what I need. Let's just ask him for it right now. Just close your eyes with me. Let's just ask him, Father, would you teach me solitude? Would you teach me to find that place in you, no matter how busy my day looks? Would you teach me to value this place of rest, reflection, Repentance, revelation, so that I'm looking for it. I'm actually looking for it in every day. Father, I thank you that you draw me close because I want to break through to the next thing you have, Lord, in my life. I don't want to get stuck in the hurts or the wounds of the past. I want to be free to move into the perfection, the fulfillment of my purpose. Let's just ask the Lord, help me fulfill my purpose. Come on, ask him. Help me fulfill my purpose. Open up windows. Somebody's never prayed this prayer before. I just It's a whole new idea to you. But I want to, we say in West Texas, double dog dare you. I just want to double dog dare you to ask him for this. Father, would you open up little windows of boredom? that would turn into discipline and delight in you. Would you unhook me from the noise and the constant frenzy of this life to find rest in my soul? So with your eyes closed, I'm just going to give you a couple of questions. We're just going to take time right now just to experience some solitude. This is not typically what you do in church. We hate silence in church, but this is what we're going to do here this morning. Let me just give you a couple of questions. First, I want you to just kind of sit in a relaxed place, a relaxed way. Just think about your body for a second. Make sure you're relaxed. Take a deep breath in and out. It's a good start. We're coming to Your presence, Father. Papa, I want to be with you right now. I welcome your presence in me and upon me right now. You can even pray that with me if you want to. Papa, I welcome your presence in me and on me right now. I want you to sense that. Just sense his delight that you would ask. (laughs) See the grin on his face that you would ask for him to come.
Now, maybe you were brought up with a sense that God is way out there somewhere. He's up in his throne in heaven, and he's always a million miles away. I want you to declare with me. Father, I know that you're in me now by the Holy Spirit. And I know that I am in you. Let's say it again. You are in me, and I am in you. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that you are happy to be in me. Welcome, Holy Spirit. I want you to sense the peace of God as you honor Him and welcome Him. Just sense the peace of God coming on you. Some of you are saying, well, I can't, I can't get into this because I've got so many people around. I'm just trying to help you see You can have solitude in the midst of a crowd. Father, would you show me two or three things this week where I have felt stressed or overwhelmed or anxious? I'm just talking about this past week. We're reflecting now. Reflect over this last week. Father, would you just show me where I felt stressed or anxious or overwhelmed? Well, I played golf this week, so you know I felt stressed. Now, I want you to take that, whatever the Lord showed you, whatever you remember as you reflect on these last few days, somewhere you felt stressed or overwhelmed or anxious. Let's just offer that to him now and exchange that anxiety for his peace. It's very simple, isn't it? Father, I remember that, that angst. I give that to you right now. The pressure of my own self-expectations, the pressure of what somebody else might think, I give that to you today. I want you to take another deep breath. Just let that go. Just let that thing go with your exhale. Thank you, Lord. We receive your peace today. Thank you. Teach me how to be a non-anxious presence no matter where I'm at. That heaven is here when I'm here. When I walk into a stress-filled room, May I be the peace that penetrates the stress. Just stay right here with me for just a second. Father, is there anything else you want to talk to me about? Maybe from the last week, is there anything that is hindering me from moving forward?
I give that to you now. I offer up my anxiety. I offer up the place where I'm stuck, where I don't yet feel delight. I offer that up to you. Are you staying active with me? Are you praying this with me? Here's the last one. Father, would you show me some place these last few days where you took great delight in my life? Something that I did that made you smile. show you something that made him smile over your life. Thank you, Lord. Now, this is perfect. You got children laughing and playing on one side. You got sirens screaming on the other side. This, this is perfect. And right in the middle of this, the Lord wants to show you his smile. He wants to put his arms around you. So that you'll know, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I'm here. Every disciple must learn to move in to solitude with the Lord. Father, teach me. Thank you for it. Thank you for it. Kevin, you want to come up? If you can just take that background music down just a little bit. I want us to take just a moment. <clears throat> For those of you that will, just want to respond. Anything that you've heard the Lord say to you this morning, you just want to respond to that. Just one at a time, audibly. So we normally say we don't have a lot of room here for an altar. Uh, but just where you are, something you've heard the Lord say to you this morning and just want to give him thanks for that or respond to him in that. Let's just take a moment, just one at a time, audibly. Thank you, Lord. If you're willing to be weak, I'll meet you in your weakness. Pray it out nice and loud so we can hear it. Thank you, Lord. Yeah. Anybody want to just give the Lord thanks for something that he said to you this morning? Just want to thank you for it. Thank you, Lord, for showing. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Thank you, Lord. Yeah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for showing me that my walks with Ali is a window of solitude that you've given to me. Thank you.
Thank you, Lord. So even though we don't have a, a physical altar, what we've, what we've been doing here is we are coming to the altar in our responses. And um, I encourage you, if you like, you don't have to, but if anyone wants to come up to the front as a continuation of the altar here, um, as we sing this last song, as we worship in his presence, and just ask the Lord, Father, I want, or I want all that you have for me. It's just a simple statement. Hands lifted, eyes lifted to the, him, to the Lord and say, Father, I just want everything you have for me. Do you agree with that? Yes. So the stand and that's if you want to come up. Your presence, 
seats for just a second. Uh, transition, we're going to have a, give the, the serve team a little bit more time, just a couple more minutes to finish setting up. Um, if you're new here, um, we do have uh, lunch 